it may sound self-serving because, as you know, I write for the Daily Word. But they are getting better and better, it seems to me. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, meditation. Yes. Thank you. And it ties in, of course it does, because synchronicity is the name of the game. It ties in with everything I wanted to talk about today, uh, with indirectly with the state of the world, but really looking at, for a, a, how many times have we done this, but looking at the hero's journey, that journey that is not just simply the journey of a lifetime, the journey to knowing and expressing our spiritual truth, to being the Christ in expression fully, without distractions, without clouds, fully the Christ. Now we work with that over a lifetime, or over many lifetimes perhaps. We work in the course of a day. There are moments in each day when we make the choice that is truly from the Christ. We're not living there yet. I'm not. I don't know about you. I'm not living as a Christ quite yet. But uh, maybe next week I'll... <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Yeah, you never know. You never know. And there's a hero's journey involved every time we face a choice between fear and love. It's a, there's a hero's journey that brought us to that choice and carries us through that choice to its fulfillment. We've talked about the five roles that we play as we move through any hero's journey, however vast or however small it may be. The orphan. First of all, we're, we're an orphan. Harry Potter is an orphan. Luke Skywalker is an orphan. Uh, Dorothy Gale is an orphan. Um, there's that sense of not quite belonging where I am, that sense of restlessness that impels us forward to discover a new possibility, to make a new choice, a sense of not wanting to remain where I am um, any longer. And so we step across the threshold of adventure. Something happens, an extraordinary incident happens. An owl flies in the window with an invitation. A rabbit hops by with, with a pocket watch and says, I'm late, I'm late. Something that forces us to make a decision. Do we stay in this restless state where we safely are or do we venture forth? Venturing forth does not take us into the kingdom. It leads us to a time of wandering. Think of Moses and the Israelites in the desert. Um, think of, I don't know, Dorothy on the yellow brick road. There's a, there's a process of wandering where you may not be clear what's going on. Um, frequently you may be sorry that you ever crossed that threshold and moved into, into the wanderer. But eventually, we become, it doesn't, sound like an, it doesn't sound like progress, but it is, we become a victim. Think of Dorothy in the clutches of the witch. You know, we, have to, we have to confront, we can't, wanderers, if anything negative happens, pack up and move on. That's what wanderers do, that's what nomads do. You know, I'm not going to deal with this issue, I'm just going to move around it and get, go on my way. And that's fine when we're wanderers. But eventually we have to stand and say, I am a victim of the world around me. Not in any, any negative sense, not in any blame sense, or at least I hope not, but just in a realization. Now, we have, I think, spent a lot of time, you and I, all of us together, in the transition from the first to role to the last. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have, have it, hadn't felt that restless urge to, to look for something more. Um, very few people are born and raised and remain in unity. You know, they, we're all from another path, another belief system, and we, we something called us to explore. And so here we are this morning. In fact, though, I think we're. I think part of the problem. Part of the challenge we're facing in the world today is that we're trying to stay there. The, 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 uh, the, the orphan becoming the wanderer, 
but we have to be willing to step into victim so that we can move through to warrior. We haven't noticed that our roles are changing, and we are much further along in our spiritual journey than we might think. You are much further along on your journey than you may assume or think, because your, your assumptions are based on yesterday. And today is a new day. Today is the day the Lord has made. I was reminded this week, as I worked on this talk, of a, one of my favorite moments, well, you hear me say that all the time, don't you? One of my favorite moments in Scripture, which is um, from the first book of Samuel. Now, the people are now living in their tribes, raising their crops, living their lives in individual groups. Occasionally, if one tribe is threatened or attacked, they will merge, come together under a leader called a judge, and they will deal with the threat, and then go back to their individual realms, their individual areas. And eventually, they get kind of tired of that. They just get restless with that way of life, and they say, you know what we need? We need a king. We need a king who can bring us all together and lead us and represent us and especially protect us. We just, we, this, this up and down, up and down is getting annoying. Now, Samuel is the high priest at this time. And at first, his human mind says, not a good idea because you're going to be giving away powers you're not even aware of and it's going to, it, could, it could get sticky. So. I, probably not a good idea. But the people insist, and Samuel then goes to his heart. And the, this story is all about the difference between choosing from head and choosing from heart. And in his heart, he sees that the people may need whatever experiences this may lead to, positive or negative. So he says, okay, let's have a king. And there was only one likely candidate, and that was Saul. Saul was the high school quarterback, he was big and strong, and he was a soldier, and he looked great, he looked like a king, and he carried himself well. So they all said, let's make Saul the king. And for a while, that was very effective. He led them in battles, and they won battles, but they were winning out of fear. They were fighting because they were afraid of their neighbors, and so they fought to defend themselves. But it wasn't long before success went to Saul's head. And he, the authority that people had given him became addictive. And he became taking more and more on himself until it became clear to Samuel, at least, that the Lord was no longer supporting this arrangement. So Samuel went in search of a new king. He was guided by to look beyond outer appearances and to and to um, let the Lord call the shots. He was guided to a small farm, farm outside of Bethlehem. Um, and there were a family with several brothers. And the, the, the older brothers were all presented to him. It reminds me of the prince in Cinderella, you know, when you're on the slipper. And Samuel said, no, 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 these are nice people, but they're not the next king. And he said, don't you have anyone else? Because why was I driven here if otherwise? And the, fa the father says, well, you know, David, but David's a little kid, and he's out in the fields taking care of the sheep, so we can be here. And Samuel says, well, bring David in. And David comes in, and Samuel says, this is the next king. And he anoints him right then and there. And so the kingdom of David, that vision that Jews hold to this day of a time of prosperity and, a, and power and strength, the kingdom of David begins in that moment and will extend hundreds of years to the birth of Christ awareness because, of course, Jesus of Nazareth was of the lineage of David. Now, it's tempting, but it's dangerous, I think, to take this story into the world and apply it too judgmentally to the current political status. Fundamentalism seems to be
prevalent wherever we look in the world. I was struck this week by, you've heard me quote before, the Franciscan author Richard Rohr, who said that our society today consists of three energies. A political energy <coughs> involving the manipulation of power. An economic energy involving the manipulation of money. A religious um, energy involving conflicting theories about God. And there are fundamentalists in every one of those areas, aren't there? Um, it's, it's a clinging to victim identity and refusing to move forward. Fundamentalists believe that they are victims, that the world is a dangerous place or an evil place even for those religious believers, religious fundamentalists. Um, and that the thing to do is to keep doing what we've done before, resist any change, and hope for different results. <laughs> And we know that's not going to work, but it seems to be where we are right now, doesn't it? Now, this in itself is an important accomplishment, even reaching this fundamentalism. But we need to move away, we need to stop moving away and to stand still, accepting the struggle to claim what is ours, not backing off from the struggle because there shouldn't be a struggle, if we were doing it right, of course there's going to be a struggle. That's part of the journey. We initially feel overwhelmed by the forces opposing and resentful of their apparent power. And you can see that wherever you look today. And yet, even when we achieve some victories, we are still in victim consciousness so long as we live in fear of the opposing forces. We may win victories, but if they're based on fear, they're not going to move us forward. It is not the sense of power or helplessness that makes us victims. It is the fear. It is always the fear. The truth is, David would eventually fight many more battles than Saul ever did. But he fought them as a warrior, not as a victim. He didn't fight battles out of fear, but he accepted the need to fight battles in order to achieve a greater goal. The warrior is not so much about attacking other people, it's about standing your ground. It's about holding to your truth and resisting whatever attempts there are to move you off that center and to change um, what you believe. I think this is very descriptive of where we find ourselves today. The key perception here is that victims often consider themselves to be warriors. They're fighters, yes, but they are Saul fighting out of victim consciousness and out of arrogance and fear. And I too see this wherever I look. I see many people fighting today out of a resentment that they or others are victims of the system. And that's an important step, but we need to move through it. We need to stop seeing ourselves as victims. We need to recognize what it is we stand for and to stand for it. And we're seeing that happen, are we not? Um, women are seeing that happen in a big, big way right now. Um, saying, okay, enough. I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept my role in, in this victim society. And I'm not going to allow myself to be treated as a victim by others. Moving forward does not mean that we stop fighting battles. That's, ultimate, that's our ultimate goal. But it's not a realistic attitude at this present moment. We live in a world of duality. What moves us forward is a new reason for the battles and a clear and loving intention to quickly reach a state in which the need for battles ends. There's a big difference, I think, between fighting battles and the belief that there are, there are always going to be more battles to fight and fighting a battle in the hopes that this is the def defining battle, um, that they will become unnecessary afterward. This means that the true warriors we need are not necessarily those who are winning battles with victim consciousness. True warriors may be quietly keeping the sheep somewhere, too insignificant to even be considered, completely removed from the existing victim power structure. And now let's take the story to its deepest, most important level, the metaphysical dimension, excuse me, at which these characters and events become elements in our own consciousness. This is the, I won't say unique, but certainly 
Yes, I will. This is the unique contribution of unity to Bible studies and Bible understanding. Is Charles Fillmore was a, a pioneer in saying every character, every place in the Bible corresponds to thoughts in mind. And w what we can learn at the deepest level of the Bible is how to control and work with and recognize the thoughts in mind. So, to what extent do you find yourself embracing the role of victim? Who is Saul within you, fighting battles, often successfully, sometimes not, but always with a sense of duality, anger, resentment, or fear? And that's not to judge ourselves harshly if we occasionally find Saul still calling the shots. We give thanks for that awareness we wouldn't have had so long ago. When we were wandering, we didn't even have this victim consciousness. We have to move beyond it, but it, we move beyond it by being grateful for the experience of it in our lives. And who is David in you? What apparently weak, feeble, insignificant thought, idea, dream is living quietly within you, waiting to make you a warrior? You won't find David through the judgments and expectations of victim consciousness. The Lord does not see as mortals, Samuel writes. The Lord does not see as mortals. They look on the outer appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Of course, it's interesting to know that I think when David is finally found, we're told he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord don't make ugly. <laughs> so when we see with the heart, true beauty emerges, no matter what the victim consciousness may see, the true heart consciousness sees the beauty. So we can see, I hope, that the biblical transfer of power from Saul to David in us is a progression from angry, punishing victim consciousness to that of a warrior willing to fight as necessary to hold to his vision and achieve her kingdom. Now, it doesn't mean that we, that we fight against victims, but we have to recognize that we cannot back into victim consciousness. No matter how much we may agree with its ends or its purpose, to, if we're fighting out of fear, if we're fighting out of anger and rage, we need to move beyond that to fight out of simply an awareness of the power we are. And when we know that, there's really no more need for battle. Uh, or if there is, it will be a very different battle. It will simply be a resistance to be, to be dissolved. That comes up for me when I'm asked about, as I was this week in an interview, um, asked about the, the, the woman's movement now and the, uh, how I see that. And I see, I, I, I see how glorious it is, and how about, how about time it is. And I see that if it, if it comes from victim consciousness, it can become dangerous. It can become, um, we can find ourselves blaming everybody and creating issues where there are no issues simply to be the victim. Uh, the, the movement is not about seeing women as victims. Women is about seeing women as warriors. Mm -hmm. And that's what really has to happen. So I would invite you, you've had one beautiful meditation already, but let's take a moment to just close our eyes, sit comfortably in our chairs. Let each breath move you, move your inner focus to the center of your being to your very heart. And in that heart center, that upper room, we know ourselves to be one with the Lord of our being. Ask the Lord to show you your inner David, the quiet, powerful, perhaps underappreciated part of you that is meant to move you forward. Rise and anoint him, the Lord says, 
for this is the one. I feel the Spirit of the Lord come mightily upon my own David from that day forward. Thank you, Saul, for carrying me safely to this point. Thank you, David, for the realizations that lie ahead. Thank you, Lord, for your eternal presence and guidance. Thank you, God, and amen.